Hey all here at OS Reviews, several days ago we did a throwback retro review of the Nokia X7 in 2018. Surprisingly, aside from the App Store, it's still a mostly functional smartphone. I thought it'd also be a fitting time to do a throwback look at the Symbian OS evolution through Nokia smartphones. Obviously, today's crop of Nokia devices crafted by HMD Global employ Android OS, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because Symbian development has definitely fallen behind since uh, it was mostly discontinued, and we have many more apps that modern consumers would want in Android, sadly, here in 2018. But still, if you're feeling nostalgic, this might be an interesting look back at, again, some of Nokia's OS choices through the years. So we're going to start with a C6, which is actually running on Symbian version 60, uh, and it has a touchscreen display measuring at 3.2 inches, uh, and it has a resistive screen. So back when Nokia were crafting some of their earlier touchscreen smartphones, including the iconic uh, N97, they employed resistive screens, which is one of the reasons why uh, they weren't quite as sensitive as competing iPhones and Androids at the time, which had already, for the most part, moved into capacitive screens, which are, uh, again, much more lucid for your fingers. But you can see the interface is comprised of three menus that correlates with some widgets, which are displayed in this very grid-like appearance, along along with several apps that you can customize, contacts, as well as notifications through social media, email services, uh, as well as time and date and battery information on the top. The Symbian S60 platform is similar to Windows Mobile in the sense that it really didn't see a major overhaul until it got into the later stages with the Symbian uh, Bell, as well as Anna, as well as Mego, but by then it was already uh, a little bit too late for most consumers. Uh, although it was customizable, it definitely wasn't really attractive, and uh, you were kind of fixed in terms of the number of widgets that you could use, download, and reprogram this thing with. There weren't any transitions in terms of flip, flipping back and forth between the pages, and if you did have a touchscreen phone like this one, uh, sometimes the icons and menus would be pretty small, and since it's a resistive screen, uh, sometimes you had to use your nails or use a stylus, just like on Windows Mobile. So definitely not as user-friendly uh, in terms of its icons and as its layout as more modern smartphone OSs such as, again, Android or iOS. So here's the menu. You can see that it does allow you to have a little bit of kinetic scrolling, uh, but that was a pretty new feature for Nokia and Symbian at the time. And you had uh, these little dots that showed up that meant the apps here were currently running in the background, so a very uh, kind of primitive multitasking that was employed. And there's also kind of these folders and menus. You can see some of these more modern apps, which uh, still do work when we did our throwback of the C6 uh, a few months ago. So overall, it was a, a functional OS and definitely one that is uh, pretty iconic looking back. But again, it did involve a lot of like tapping back and forth between panels and pages, selection keys, which definitely isn't as consistent as uh, today's modern operating systems. Uh, but still, it was again what most, uh, the majority in fact, of uh, Nokia smartphones in history uh, ran on this S60 platform. So moving on, we have one of the later uh, branches of Symbian, which is Symbian Anna, later upgraded to Symbian Bell, which are pretty similar in terms of the visual icons and fonts. Tapping here, we have an oversized clock. So you see this, you can tap to unlock, and that is the difference with the S60, which had this kind of slide to unlock, or just a physical bar on the side. Um, and by the time that we went to the Anna and Bell smartphones, most of these were powered with uh, AMOLED display, so you have a lot more vibrancy and, and contrast between the colors. They also were capacitive screens, uh, all, of, all of these phones, so they were a lot more responsive by default. Furthermore, um, all of these icons were now slightly larger, they had rounded corners, and so graphically it was a lot more attractive and similar to something like what iOS and Android were offering. Um, so it was a pretty step big step forwards in terms of the way it looked, but uh, underneath in terms of how lots of the menus and some of the fonts and designs were still retained from the older S60 first, second, and third generations that we saw through the years. And so if we take a closer look here, again, it has a very similar uh, layout where you can customize widgets as well as uh, specific programs that you can add shortcuts to the main menus, but now you can see that the wallpapers are dynamically changing. So there's a, there's a more gentle kind of transition as you swipe back and forth, just like on Android. It's not at this abrupt jump whenever you swipe. Similarities from X60 uh, include the placement of the battery status uh, 
bar on the top right hand corner along with the time and date information and some of how these text menus are placed. But it also builds upon that with some newer features which were very useful. For instance, I can now tap on the uh, battery status to take a look at the specific percentage and let's say activate power saving mode if I wanted to. So although this still wasn't as complex as a drag down notification shade, which we later saw with Symbian Bell, this is actually an Anna phone, um, at least it gave you more options and settings to use when you tapped on the top of the phone. So in terms of its menus, we also had these little circular dots, which like with the S60 phone before it, uh, told you that the app was currently open in the RAM and you could simply jump into it for, again, multitasking use. I can also tap on multi uh, applications, again, kinetic scrolling. Uh, it looks, again, a lot more modern in terms of how its icons uh, are rounded off. And it was definitely a lot more aesthetically pleasing uh, from a design perspective. A lot of these apps are also completely rehauled from the ground up in terms of their design. There were still the same suite of kind of office related apps built on in. Some of them, of course, saw some minor updates. There was also, uh, again, access to the OV store. Uh, there was also maps for turn-by-turn -turn directions. So all of these things were, again, pretty similar to what we saw before on the S60 smartphones, but uh, with slight enhancements underneath the hood. And finally, we can move on to the Nokia N9, which is sadly the only smartphone in the world that runs on the Miko operating system. Now, Miko isn't exactly, I would say, a branch of Symbian. In fact, it should be categorized as its separate uh, operating system. Now, obviously, the parents of all these OSs, whether it's iOS, Android, or Symbian, are based on Linux uh, underneath the hood. But the differences are profound enough that I would say Miko is different from even Symbian, Anna, and Bell. Uh, with that being said, we still have access to very similar looking hardware, including that 4-inch AMOLED panel, um, as well as now an always-on display. This was one of the first phones that used double tap to unlock many years ago. And what's interesting about Miko, of course, is it's using swipes for everything, uh, for navigation, which was quite handy because uh, the phone doesn't have any physical keys and made the experience feel very fluid and responsive. So Miko was quite ahead of its time, similar to HP and Palm's WebOS. It was, again, built entirely off of swipes. But the only way, reason why I'm putting this along with Symbian um, is because of the way how the icons are displayed and again how Nokia had a really heavy hand in the development of the OS. So you see a lot of similarities in how the text and icons are placed. Um, so I would say this is again more similar to Symbian because of that than Windows Phone or Android as we have it today uh, compared to other Nokia devices in history. With Migo, we have just this main page, which is vertically scrolling of all your applications, and then a secondary page of all your open apps that opens in these cards for easier multitasking. For instance, if I open up the phone, I can exit out of this by swiping up, just like on the iPhone, um, and I can swipe over from the edge as well uh, if I wanted to exit out of that. So it gives me quite a few different options. I can also swipe up slowly to have access to a dock of more commonly used apps, uh, but I can swipe up completely to close it up and then it's opened here as my previously used applications. I can tap again to go back into that app or I can kind of long hold to get rid of these apps. Um, so pretty useful and uh, intuitive. Uh, finally, there's a third screen that was dedicated to your notifications. It showed your time and date in addition to weather uh, and then it went back to your main apps. So though it looks visually similar to uh, Symbian, Anna, and Bell on first glance, uh, Migo is definitely light years ahead in terms of its consistency, its elegance, and its simplicity, uh, just because everything was redesigned from the ground up instead of just adding a few highlights and, and few enhancements compared to previous iterations. Um, otherwise, we still have access to very similar apps on both of these, so there's the same uh, kind of access to Nokia Maps for turn-by-turn -turn directions. You had some social media services. Now, what we did lose was the battery status icon in the top right-hand corner, which is kind of a cornerstone in itself of Nokia design. They always like to put their battery status as these tiny bars, even on their really old-fashioned candy bar form factor "Quote unquote dumb phones," uh, but you don't get that with this with the N9 and Migo OS. But instead, it trades it for a notification shade, just like on Android or iOS today. So there you go. That was a nostalgic look back at uh, Nokia's previous smartphone OSs, was primarily with Symbian and ending with Migo uh, in terms of how their designs have evolved, influenced, as well as shaped Nokia smartphones in that iconic era. So you can check out more details of about these specific phones. Actually, we did throwbacks on all three of these devices on this channel if you're interested, as well as comparisons between uh, even more different mobile operating systems. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews.